Excellent. Well, Your Excellencies, colleagues, partners, and friends, uh, a very warm welcome to the launch of the summary findings and recommendations of the Global Center on Cooperative Securities, sixth iteration of the Blue Sky Report. My name is Ilko Kessels, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Center. Uh, the Blue Sky Report is released on the margins of the biannual review of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy and offers independent reflections on how to optimize UN counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism efforts. And in preparing the reports, the Global Center conducts research and wide-ranging consultations with diverse stakeholders while drawing from a broader experience working with governments, civil society, and the private sector to understand how UN efforts are guiding policies and practices for communities affected by terrorism and counterterrorism globally. Since we started the Blue Sky series in 2012, the central argument has been consistent. The United Nations and its partners should leverage the comparative advantages of the organization to improve policy development, interagency coordination, coordination and the design and impact of human rights-based counterterrorism and PCVE efforts. Two decades since 9-11 and with the 20th anniversary of the strategy coming up in 2026, it is high time for a thorough evaluation of both the successes and the negative impacts of global counterterrorism and PCVE efforts while continuing to promote accountability and transparency in member state actions to advance the balanced implementation of the strategy at a national and global level. Our sixth report again underscores the need for standardized monitoring and evaluation practices and a unified results framework for UN counterterrorism entities to assess implementation of the strategy at three levels, global, institutional, and programmatic. This need for evaluation continues to remain urgent but it's stymied by a lack of nuanced conversation about what needs to be evaluated, by whom, and for what purpose. Extending the strategy review cycle may offer more time to implement responsive UN counterterrorism and PCVE programs and more robustly monitor and evaluate progress between review cycles. A copy of our summary findings and recommendations are shared here with you today, with our full report being released in the coming weeks. Further recommendations of the Blue Sky 6 report will be presented by Tracy Derner, Global Center's Chief of Programs, and Melissa Lefas, our Chief of Strategy, followed by reflections from our panel, consisting of Assistant Secretary General Natalie German, the Executive Director of UNCTAD, Rafi Gagorian, the Deputy to the Undersecretary General and Director at the UN Office for Counterterrorism, Fanula, uh, Fanula Nioloin, who will join us virtually, Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while Countering Terrorism, and Mandeep Tiwana, Chief Programs Officer at Civicus. We will then open the floor for your responses and questions. We've inscribed several pre-requested interventions, both in the room and online, but welcome additional reflections and questions by you all here, uh, granted that uh, we have time to actually tackle those. And please note that today's event is being live streamed on UN Web TV and will be uploaded to the Global Center's website and it will therefore be on the record. And then finally, I want to thank the governments of the Netherlands, Norway and Switzerland for funding the Blue Sky process and the government of Sweden for supporting our broader UN engagement. We have valued our partnerships over the years and are grateful for your continued support for this independent process. And with this, it is my great honor to welcome Ambassador Mona Yul, permanent representative of Norway to the United Nations to open a discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alko, uh, and uh, their colleagues. It is also a great pleasure for me to address you here today uh, on this important event where the Global Center on Co Cooperative Security will present its sixth Blue Sky report under the title An Independent Analysis of UN Counterterrorism Efforts. And I'm particularly pleased to address you together with our close partners and Global Center's co-founders, the Netherlands and Switzerland. The latest Blue Sky Report launch takes place during the eighth review of the, global, of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, as Helco just said. And the report itself, as well as a number of global center-driven activities leading to its publishing, provides member states with important analysis and recommendations that inform the different phases of the negotiation process. Aside from the inherent importance of the issues it <coughs> seeks to address, I would like to underline certain core principles that lend gravitas to the 
GTTS review process. These include the strategy's consensus nature and the importance of its balanced implementation along all four pillars, addressing the condition conducive to the spread of terrorism, preventing and combating terrorism, building member states' counterterrorism capacities, and ensuring a human rights-based and rule of law-focused implementation of the strategy. The Global Center's work has always been guided by its core values and principles, including the promotion and protection of human rights, adherence to the rule of law, meaningful partnership with civil society, and, not least, gender mainstreaming across all preventing and countering violent extremism efforts. Furthermore, the organization is uniquely positioned as a program implementer with activities, staff, and partners across the globe. The Global Center is active in translating local insights to international discussions, informing policymakers, and providing a platform for those most affected by terrorism and counter-terrorism measures alike. The Blue Sky process itself has also opened a number of avenues for the Global Center's wide network of civil society partners around the world to meaningfully shape the UN's counter-terrorism efforts. The Global Center was part of a select group of civil society representatives that engaged with the UN Office of Counterterrorism in the lead up to the high level international conference on human rights, civil society, and counterterrorism in Malaga in May last year, supporting concepts note and agenda development, as well as adequate civil society representation during the conference. Finally, I would like to congratulate the Global Center on the completion of another Blue Sky report and really look forward to seeing how this broad and robust independent analysis and resulting and result recommendation are received by member states and relevant UN entities. Norway has for more than a decade supported the Global Center in its role as a leading independent voice for strengthening and enhancing the effectiveness of the UN's counterterrorism efforts and will continue to remain a close partner. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Yule, for your very kind words uh, and therewith opening uh, our discussion uh, today. We're going to turn first to my uh, two colleagues, on my left, Tracy Derner, on my right, Melissa Leffes, to talk you through a, a number of the main recommendations of the report. Uh, at the entrance, you will find a copy uh, of the executive summary and the main recommendations for you to review, and I believe you should also have received those um, via email after registration. Uh, I think I will turn to Tracy, Tracy Derner first. Thank you, Elko, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We won't have time to cover all of the recommendations in the report, um, but I do want to start with just a couple of key issues that relate to optimizing the UN counterterrorism architecture, and then we'll turn to Melissa, who will share some of our cross-cutting reflections on integrating human rights, the rule of law, gender, and meaningful engagement with civil society. In terms of the architecture, given our time, I'm going to focus on key, two key parts that have seen significant evolution in recent years. Firstly, the Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact, and then the United Nations Office on Counterterrorism. So starting first with the compact. With 46 members and eight working groups, it's one of the largest coordination frameworks across the UN system. It's described as the primary institutional vehicle for the coordination and coherence of the UN's counterterrorism efforts. Operational for six years, it's seen a gradually more active, including hosting a number of working group meetings, establishing an online digital coordination platform, and engaging in the joint delivery of programs. However, the compact is still finding its footing in many ways. Opportunities for engagement with civil society and UN country staff are emerging, but remain ad hoc and uneven. The effectiveness of individual working groups is described as highly contingent on the ambitions, commitments, and personalities of their respective chairs and co-chairs. And critically, our consultations have underscored some tensions that are emerging around what coordination can and should look like, how to realize coherence, and potential uh, resource competition as well. We want to highlight three main recommendations from our report. 
The first is to collaboratively develop written procedures that guide compact operations. Our consultations underscored a lack of clarity on what constitutes a compact project versus a project or an output developed jointly by compact entities. This points to a bigger gap in that there are no standardized procedures that guide the operations of the compact. Instead, it falls to either working groups or specific initiative leads. The customary practice has been to seek consensus, but this is not held true in all cases. Notably, there are no procedures that enable compact entities to in indicate institutional red lines that are non-negotiable. Introducing standardized operating procedures would ensure that the diverse expertise of compact entities are brought to bear in an efficient and transparent manner. Secondly, there's a clear need to resource compact entities that have normative and cross-cutting functions and contributions to the compact efforts. Coordination and cooperation doesn't come free. Structural resource inequalities in the UN architecture impact the ability of compact members to contribute to its operations. Put bluntly, the chronic systemic underfunding of human rights means that the entities that are called on the most to contribute in cost-cutting ways are the least well positioned to do so. Thirdly, we encourage improving the multi-year appeal by ensuring a theory of change that prioritizes balanced implementation of the strategy. Prior iterations were seen to lack a clear vision and described instead as a laundry list of donor priorities and compact entity projects. Future processes can be consultative, anchored in the needs of communities impacted by terrorism and counterterrorism, and should result in a clear value proposition that secures sustainable and predictable funding to address complex security challenges. Shifting now to another key part of the UN's architecture, the UN Office on Counterterrorism, which serves as both the coordinator of the compact as well as plays a critical leadership role and delivers capacity development programming through two different branches. UNOCT has undergone rapid expansion and evolution since its founding in 2017. It's now supported by more than $340 million in voluntary contributions, 200 positions, and an expanding number of offices and staff around the world. With this growth comes the need for member states to critically review and guide the long-term operations of UNOCT to realize its comparative advantages. Here we offer three reflections. First, the leadership and coordination responsibilities of UNOCT should be prioritized. UNOCT can lean into this critical aspect of its mandate, limit programmatic efforts to larger and more complex projects where its unique coordination function brings value that is distinct from other capacity development entities at the UN. Second is to consider and address the sustainability of UNOCT operations carefully. UNOCT's current spend rate points to a financial cliff in the middle of 2025, absent major reinvestment. Member states have a critical responsibility to assess and leverage future fund financial contributions responsibly and in accordance with the principles endorsed in the strategy. This includes actively pushing for truly unearmarked contributions that minimize the pay-to-play culture and reinforce UNOCT's coordination and leadership mandates. And finally, assess the need for and the selection of further conversions of UNOCT positions from voluntary funding to the regular budget. UNOCT converted 25 posts to the regular budget in 2023, and the Secretary General has now proposed a further 24 posts for conversion next year. Regular budget positions are very rarely abolished, which means that these conversions have long-term resource implications. Member states should assess if and why additional UNOCT posts are deemed critical versus other important investments in the UN system. I'll leave it there for now, and with that, I'll pass it to Melissa, who will discuss some of our other cross-cutting recommendations. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and, and good afternoon, colleagues. Delighted to, to be here with you today. Optimizing the UN counterterrorism architecture is inherently interwoven with achieving the balanced implementation of the strategy. 
our Blue Sky reports have long called for greater resourcing and prioritization of Pillar 4, and this report continues that tradition. Our key findings and recommendations on the integration of the rule of law, of human rights, and gender underscore the need for multifaceted approaches leveraging the comparative advantages of different entities. Before delving into our recommendations, we note that the obligations to uphold international law, including the promotion and protection of human rights, is discursively embraced by the General Assembly, but is not matched with the global political will, leadership, and accountability mechanisms necessary to uphold these principles as the foundation of all of our counterterrorism activities. During the last two review processes, the deficits in implementing Pillar 4 of the strategy initiated critical discussions regarding internal, independent oversight of the work of the UN. While there are concerns over how such a mechanism would be mandated and operationalized, and whether an additional body would indeed achieve the aims of reducing rather than improving efficiency in integrating the rule of law and human rights, the proposal puts in stark relief the gaps in delivering on Pillar 4. Among our recommendations, we first urge member states to ensure that their collective political and financial contributions to the United Nations realize their intended aims by improving accountability, transparency, and oversight. Across UNOCT and the CT Compact, the tools and resources necessary for program managers to conduct human rights risk and opportunity analysis, including gender-specific analysis and the application of the human rights due diligence policy, are fragmented and woefully underdeveloped. Second, the design of programs and projects should be informed by CTED assessments and analysis to ensure programs promote and protect human rights and account for context. But programs must also consider relevant analysis, reports, and recommendations that draw on U UN human rights mechanisms. Third, we argue that the number of dedicated positions that cover human rights, gender, and counterterrorism issues across the UN system be increased, especially within human rights bodies. Even with new capacities added to the human rights and gender section, existing personnel and expertise across OHCHR, OCT, CTED, UN Women, and other entities cannot meet the demands to, of fully integrating these priorities. Stable, long-term posts are needed. And finally, I reiterate our call urging member states to carefully assess and consider the necessity of additional regular budget positions. Should any further positions be converted, posts should again be dedicated to the human rights and gender section, including elevating the authority of its chief. I will focus the remainder of my time on our recommendations to foster structural, meaningful, and diverse civil society engagement in the UN's counterterrorism efforts. Today, only 3.1% of the world's population live in countries with open civic space, a trend that is expected to worsen. The misuse and abuse of counterterrorism, of preventing and countering violent extremism, and countering the financing of terrorism measures are becoming increasingly widespread, and community programs are being securitized. This stands in contradiction to the fact that we produce better outcomes when we work together with an engaged, diverse civil society. Furthermore, association and engagement with the United Nations on human rights and counterterrorism can lead to human rights defenders and other non-governmental actors being subjected to undue state scrutiny and reprisals. While, while our multilateral security discussions benefit greatly from their participation, civil society put their lives and livelihoods on the line to engage in these discussions. So to realize sustained meaningful engagement, among our recommendations, we put forward the following two. First, we urge member states and UN entities to prioritize diverse civil society engagement by taking a more proactive role in protecting against retaliation, repression, and abuse by states. All UN entities have a responsibility to protect, 
promote and sustain their participation and to have the resources to do so. Secondly, we recommend that existing guidance on the protection and promotion of civil society be followed. Compact entities should regularly assess the effectiveness of existing mechanisms and access to information. We recognize important improvements by OCT in engaging with civil society, including the participatory process that led to the high-level conference hosted by OCT and the, global, and the government of Spain in Malaga, and we hope that this will be taken forward as a model. Nonetheless, civil society participation in UN counterterrorism and preventing and countering violent extremism efforts remains ad hoc, opaque, and reliant on the priorities and interests of individual member states and CT compact <coughs> entities. The recommendations you have heard today and that are included in our report go beyond the strategy review. They aim to right-size and orient the UN system to realize a more inclusive, effective, and rights-based approach. Together, they underscore the opportunities for improved oversight, transparency, and accountability. We look forward to continuing to work with you towards these goals. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues and co-authors, Melissa and Tracy, uh, for this overview of the recommendations of the Blue Sky uh, 6 reports. Uh, I'm now going to turn uh, to the panel uh, on my left and on my right uh, for some reflections on this, as well as uh, the UN's broader uh, counterterrorism and PCVE efforts. And uh, first on my list uh, is uh, ASG Natalia uh, German, uh, the Executive Director of UN CTAT. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, uh, excellencies, uh, dear friends. I'm very pleased to be here with you today and take this opportunity to reflect on the sixth edition of the Blue Sky Report and on the work of the Counterterrorist Committee Executive Directorate within the broader United Nations counterterrorism architecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Elka Kessels and uh, indeed all our long-standing partners in the Global Center on Cooperative Security for providing this platform for engagement, as well as the governments of the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and Sweden for their valuable support. The biennial release of the Blue Sky Report, coinciding with the Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review, is one of the most important items on the counterterrorism calendar at the United Nations. And let me also recognize uh, the participation at today's discussion of His Excellency Ambassador of Tunisia uh, and uh, His Excellency the Deputy Ambassador of Canada the co-facilitators, the co-chairs of this year's review process wish them all success in their uh, not an easy job. We are sure it will be successful. So uh, now the report itself, of course, provides the member states and entities of the United Nations Counterterrorist Global Coordination Compact with a critical and constructive viewpoint from which to assess, review, and strategize our collective multilateral counterterrorism efforts now as well as in the coming years. And this year's report is no exception, because the last um, global strategies review took place during a time of significant change and significant reform. This iteration of the strategy is set to consolidate progress made in recent years and to measure the significance of our collaborative efforts in this regard. And this Blue Sky Report does much the same, taking stock of the United Nations counterterrorism architecture, envisaging enhanced cooperation among compact entities, and considering our overall impact as one UN. Additionally, the report provides us with a window into the experience and expertise of civil society in countering terrorism. Civil society not only defends mechanisms for the protection of human rights in counterterrorism policies at national and international levels, but they also offer significant evidence-based and experience-based uh, insight into improving the effectiveness of prevention and counterterrorism practices. It is incumbent on us to consider these perspectives and incorporate them into our policy making and programming at the United Nations. Last year, the Counterterrorist Committee hosted a special meeting in New Delhi, which set a high watermark for engagement with the civil society. 
while discussing the challenges of new and emerging technologies, including the countering of terrorism financing, information and communication technology, and the threat posed by terrorist use of unmanned aircraft systems. The committee benefited significantly from the expertise and experiences of a broad range of civil society representatives, academics, and human rights defenders. That productive dialogue has only continued. Tasked with developing a set of non-binding guiding principles on behalf of the committee to address terrorists' misuse as well as the state's use of new and emerging technologies, CETAT has ensured a consultative and inclusive pro approach. In drafting the non-binding guiding principles, CETAT has sought contributions from more than 100 civil society, academic, and technical partners. Over 50 civil society organizations have contributed to the formulation of the three sets of principles and discussed the benefits and risks of new technologies. And this has been uh, taking place through virtual workshops as well as uh, through written contributions, which we are still receiving and incorporating as we continue to develop the principles. The principles will assist the member states in countering the threat posed by the use of new and emerging technologies for terrorist purposes, in line with international human rights standards, and of course will include a gender perspective. Dear colleagues, see that's mandate. As it is spelled out in Security Council resolutions, including most recently Resolution 2617, places assessment of Member States' implementation of relevant Council resolutions at the core of our counterterrorism efforts. Our work ensures thorough, consistent, and coherent assessment of 193 Member States. These assessments are also implement, uh, complemented by CTED's rich expert analysis. We have been working closely with uh, our partners, such as United Nations Office of Counterterrorism and the Global Compact Entities, to provide informed and evidence-based data that could benefit compact entities and their programming, allowing for projects and programs to be tailored to specific needs of member states. However, we do recognize that more needs to be done to maximize our capacities and uh, enhance our impact in a more meaningful way. The Global Compact's digital coordination platform, for example, has allowed for access to critical data in CDET's assessments that will better inform the design, planning, and implementation of technical assistance and capacity building programs. And we work closely with our counterparts in constantly updating and improving this platform to maximize benefit. Furthermore, CDET remains committed to following up on its recommendations and insights with all its compact partners and engaging in open dialogue to better align our resources, capabilities, and impact. The Security Council has underscored the importance of strong coordination and cooperation between CDET and UNOCT as we each work within our specific mandates and distinct roles towards ensuring effective United Nations engagement with member states to improve the implementation of the global counter-terrorism strategy and other counter-terrorism resolutions in a balanced manner. We highly value our partnership with UNOCT and we believe that against the backdrop of the ever-changing and ever-evolving terrorism landscape a whole of UN approach is more important than ever. As such, we must increase our efforts to strengthen our cooperation to develop comprehensive policy responses that address radicalization to violence, provide support to the most affected countries, and create and implement effective, coordinated, and comprehensive counter-terrorism policies while upholding international human rights mechanisms and gender-sensitive approaches. I thank you. Thank you so much, ASG Gaman, uh, for your remarks and reflections, uh, which all, um, uh, in many ways, are reflected into the um, uh, Blue Sky 6 report as well, um, as we seek to improve the UN's broader counterterrorism efforts um, and, of course, uh, CETA's role uh, with, within those. I'm now going to turn uh, to my left, uh, your right, uh, to Rafi Gagorian, uh, Deputy Under Secretary General and Director at the UN Office of Counterterrorism.
Rafi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elko, and good afternoon, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and let me associate myself with ASG Gehrman's uh, acknowledgement and thanks to the co-facilitators and um, uh, to the others involved in the, in the review. And I'd certainly like to thank Global Center, who had a role in the issues surrounding the creation of our office in 2017 and for inviting UNOCT to speak today on the launch of the sixth Blue Sky Report. Look, today's event really couldn't be more timely. Member states are in the third or maybe just finished the third and final round of negotiations on the eighth review of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, the strategy for which they have primary, primary responsibility for implementing. And while member states have been able to make some gains in the fight against terrorism, it still remains a major threat to international peace and security. The threat posed by terrorist groups such as Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and their affiliates based in and around conflict zones, particularly in Africa, have actually increased in some instances, while in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, terrorists actually enjoy far more freedom than do women and girls. Terrorists remain agile, adapting to new circumstances, and utilizing technologies such as cryptocurrencies and unmanned aerial systems for terrorist purposes. The ideologies driving terrorism are also diversifying, with many hateful ideologies resurging as part of the rise of terrorist attacks motivated by xenophobia, racism, and other forms of intolerance or in the name of religion or belief. These acts of terrorism pose an increasing danger on a worldwide scale, requiring united and comprehensive responses. But this bleak picture should not mask the important efforts that have been made to counter terrorism and violent extremism institutionally and globally. The latest Blue Sky Report highlights many such efforts while providing recommendations to ensure they remain fit for purpose. And speaking of such efforts, I am delighted to share that the Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact, set up by the Secretary General in 2018 and led by UNOCT, has officially welcomed the International Monetary Fund as an observer, becoming its 46th entity. The compact is the largest coordination framework at the United Nations, and its continued growth can be attributed to its comprehensive approach facilitated by its eight thematic working groups dedicated online platform and joint programming. These initiatives foster effective coordination while shaping a coherent counterterrorism agenda within the UN system. But as highlighted in the Blue Sky Report, we believe the compact can and should further leverage its members' comparative advantages. UNOCT will continue to enhance the compact's effectiveness, including by making it a comprehensive platform for member states to access information on UN counterterrorism initiatives and facilitating collaboration with compact entities. We will also enhance the compact's digital platform, featuring a dedicated page for member states' national counterterrorism policies, priorities, good practices, and regional cooperation frameworks. This will promote understanding of country and regional needs and facilitate the exchange of information, relevant practices, and lessons learned. We will, of course, continue to prior, prioritize an inclusive approach by engaging with civil society organizations and other stakeholders to help inform and shape the development of policies and programs. Finally, it is essential for UN entities and member states to collaborate and ensure that forthcoming initiatives within the compact foster cooperation rather than generate competition among UN entities acknowledging the lessons learned in this regard. And we are pleased to see that this is reflected in the Blue Sky Report, as the Secretary General has himself urged greater horizontal coordination. In my personal opinion, this means we need to look at how to make sure the UN's counterterrorism approaches are appropriately reflected in the analysis and work of UN country teams led by a resident coordinator system, particularly in settings where a member state is confronted with a terrorist insurgency that requires a whole of society response. The Compact's Resource Mobilization, Monitoring, and Evaluation Working Group is also working to launch a UN joint appeal for counterterrorism in Africa, which is now considered to be the epicenter of terrorism today, and why UNOCT and Nigeria will organize an African counterterrorism summit early next year. The joint appeal, which we will launch during Counterterrorism Week, consists of 10 joint initiatives by compact entities that have been carefully selected based on their proven track record and potential of achieving transformative and impactful results, 
strategic value proposition of multiple entities working together, responsiveness to CTED recommendations, value for money, high innovation potential, and a strong focus on the integration of human rights and gender considerations. Speaking of value for money, let me speak briefly about funding for UNOCT. First, an important clarification, if you allow me. The executive summary of the Blue Sky Report says that UNOCT, quote, is now supported by more than $340 million in voluntary contributions to the UN Trust Fund for Counterterrorism, unquote. For those who read the entire report, you'll know this figure combines all previous contributions since the creation of the Trust Fund more than 12 years ago. To put it in perspective, that total is less than what the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau budget was for one year when I worked there. And while UNOCT's projected budget for 2023 may have been $67.6 million, our actual released budget is $54.2 million. That is why the General Assembly's approval of the Secretary General's proposal actually to convert 49 positions, broken up into two tranches, but their uh, approval last year to convert 20, the first 25 UNOCT XB funded positions to the regular budget was so important. The Fifth Committee and the GA recognized that having one donor support mandated functions related to policy, leadership, coordination, and other mandated functions was unsustainable. As prior to this, we were almost 97% funded by voluntary contributions and had only eight regular budget posts, including the USGs. Our hope is that the Fifth Committee will approve the rest of the SG's proposal of a second tranche of 24 positions, which will then give us about the same number of RB-funded posts as CTED has and confirm a business model where XB funds are used for capacity building and technical assistance programs rather than policy and coordination and becomes increasingly integrated into UN frameworks like the new agenda for peace. As one of the four co-leads preparing the policy brief on a new agenda for peace, UNOCT has ensured that it reflects the complexities around terrorism and the need to further integrate our counterterrorism work across the UN peace and security pillar. The February 2023 report of the Secretary General on the activities of the UN system in implementing the global counterterrorism strategy emphasizes the significance of meaningfully involving civil society in efforts aimed at preventing and countering terrorism. It's one of the big features of the Blue Sky Report as well. We believe that while some progress has been made in adopting a comprehensive approach that includes all sectors of society, there is still work to be done to ensure civil society's regular and safe engagement with the UN system. UNOCT continues to work with civil society partners to explore ways to implement its civil society engagement strategy, including recommendations articulated in the Malaga outcome document alongside its ongoing engagement, such as the periodic civil society roundtables, which I moderate, to facilitate regular exchange between civil society and UNOCT. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that the Malaga outcome document of the high-level international conference on human rights, civil society, and counterterrorism is now available on UNOCT's website. To further facilitate civil society engagement, UNOCT continues to seek grant-making authority to improve cost efficiency and allow strengthened partnership with civil society. We are working with relevant offices, UN offices, to secure necessary approvals. But the status quo is both unnecessarily expensive, time-consuming, and obliges us to have CSOs use the UN procurement bidding system, something most CSOs uh, are not equipped to do. This means we must transfer funds to them through other UN entities that do have grant authority. For our part, UNOCT already has established a set of robust internal controls, and these could be readily expanded to ensure that grants are properly evaluated, awarded, and tracked in accordance with UN regulations and rules. The full integration of the rule of law, human rights, and gender equality in UN counterterrorism efforts are paramount and will require appropriate internal technical capacity as necessary preconditions to truly materialize as described in the Secretary General's report. Considerable progress has been made in incorporating human rights and gender considerations in preventing and countering terrorism, including through the Compact's dedicated working group on protecting and promoting human rights, the rule of law, and supporting victims of terrorism, chaired by OHCHR with UNOCT as vice chair 
as well as through the working group on adopting a gender sensitive approach to preventing and countering terrorism chaired by UN Women and CTED as vice chair. In line with the recommendation of the Blue Sky Report, the UN needs more dedicated positions across the system, including through the provision of sustained funding. It's all well and good for member states to pound the table about the importance of human rights and gender, but resources need to follow the rhetoric. For our part, UNOCT established a dedicated human rights and gender section in 2022, which the GA formally approved at the end of last year. UNOCT, of course, understands the added value of a standardized monitoring and evaluation approach across compact entities to assess the implementation of the strategy as recommended in the Blue Sky Report, with a focus on the integration of the rule of law, human rights, and gender into our counterterrorism efforts. And finally, UNOCT is committed to ongoing collaboration with member states, international regional organizations, compact entities, civil society, academia, and the private sector. Together, we strive to ensure the comprehensive and multilateral approaches to CT are both effective and in line with international law, particularly international humanitarian and human rights law. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rafi, for your reflections and responses to some of the elements in the, in the report. Uh, very, very insightful. Um, we are going to uh, move now uh, to a virtual speaker, uh, to Fanula Nialoin, the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms uh, While Countering Terrorism. Uh, Fanula, I hope uh, we have you with us. We do, I think, if everything is working. We are there. We can hear you and see you. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many, many friends. It's as always a pleasure to join you to affirm the value of the Blue Skies Report and uh, to acknowledge the work of the Global Center in bringing us through this process and presenting it at this critical time. Uh, it's also, of course, echoing uh, uh, Rafi, it's, uh, it, it's clear that this is emerging and it's published at a point when many of its recommendations speak to the issues that are at the heart of immediate conversations between member states in the Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review. I'd like to just very briefly reflect more broadly on what I think is the value proposition of the Blue Skies exercise and report. Member states and key stakeholders have actually very few opportunities to press pause on their counterterrorism engagements, to meaningfully stand back and hear different perspectives, and fundamentally, particularly after COVID, to get to know one another as experts and stakeholders and relationship building is central to trust building, which is central to producing an integrity-based negotiation process that achieves the ends of balance in the global counterterrorism exercise in this strategy review, and really ensures that we can holistically uh, address these issues. So this process itself is perhaps one of the most important if unseen benefits of the Blue Skies process, and one that I think uh, we all have to endorse. Going forward, I think even as there's discussion on lengthening the review cycle, and which I think has many merits from the mandate's perspective, I think this also engages the point about broader discussions, a kind of enlarged blue skies process to address critical aspects of ensuring that member states can, over the long haul, have the kind of relationship building to allow them to assess if actually what they agree to is working in practice whether it's implemented in practice as they intended it to be, and whether there are actual functional, accountable, independent and robust mechanisms in place to adequately assess both what is said, what is done, and whether it's actually delivered. I think this commitment to building a diverse group of member states in dialogue with one another before and during and after these processes in the counterterrorism arena is particularly key. And I think one of the really significant parts of this is bringing human rights, civil society, and other stakeholders into the conversation. I think we've learned that we need to be listening more carefully to what not just what's happening in New York, but what's happening at the national and regional levels. And maybe there's a way that we need to think about how we bring a kind of blue skies exercise further than Tarrytown or Green Tree and reflect on the changing landscape of stakeholders not just the stakeholders in New York, but stakeholders in capitals, as well as these broader, broader other set of stakeholders, particularly civil society actors who experience the coal face of counterterrorism and co countering and preventing violent extremism every day. So I think that's one of the things actually we need to think about seriously over the longer haul. Maybe to say that one of the striking elements of the global counterterrorism strategy review process has been consensus. 
And consensus is critical, but finding that consensus in an increasingly fractured landscape is difficult as everyone, and particularly uh, the ambassadors of Tunisia and Canada know at this time. So maybe let me move from the value proposition of the blue skies process to talk a little bit about some of the challenges I think uh, that we're facing in a uh, global counterterrorism strategy review process, but more broadly in the counterterrorism landscape. I think the mandate has long understood and recognized the importance of UN efforts and engagement on counterterrorism. But I and my predecessors have consistently said that we need to reflect closely, not reflexively, not just based on what we did before, on what precisely these challenges are in their unique and specific context, but also holistically to understand how they have changed over time and fundamentally address that changing landscape with real investment. And where the most significant investment needs to be is in prevention. And where the least resources are going globally is in prevention. And unless we fundamentally grapple, not just with the architecture of prevention, but the investment in prevention, we are, I think, in a Groundhog Day motion where we continually respond to terrorism, but we fail to adequately, adequately address the conditions that continually produce it at the national level. And this brings me to talk about the assessment of the threat landscape. And the global study, um, the, the, uh, the study that is presented to us today really affirms in its executive summary the importance of a nuanced, nuanced assessment of the terrorism landscape. And I think that has made clear, the, the, the Global Center has made clear that we need to understand that the landscape is changing and evolving. And we say that, but actually we don't do it very well. And I think what we have consistently failed to do in this discussion about threat landscape is that we haven't really, I think, in my mind, holistically addressed what it means to talk about a threat landscape in, in, in terrorism. And what I particularly want to stress is the importance of addressing what it means to the threat landscape when we fail, in fact, to address the abuse of counterterrorism. Because the abuses that follow from counterterrorism are a threat in themselves to member states' uh, goals and aspirations in this arena. And so it's that discussion of changing landscape also has to include the costs of doing counterterrorism badly, ineffectively, or unaccountably. Second, let me underscore what I think both um, the Global Center and others have said about the need to maintain balance in the four pillars uh, and to center human rights. It is true that over essentially 20 years, we continue to have an imbalanced global counterterrorism strategy because of a failure to invest in human rights. And the costs of that failure is read in the continual production of violence and the failure to address the preventative piece that actually gets us to a better place. So the question of resources is always tricky. And as one of the entities with a zero budget base, I think I can talk to the absence of resources in this space, perhaps more humbly than others. But I would simply say to, the, to member states that if we don't invest in the human rights entities that are doing the work to prevent the kinds of violences that are produced that enable and sustain terrorism. If we don't invest in the rule of law, in independent judiciaries, in functional and fair prisons, and in strengthening the nuts and bolts of rule of law at the national level, we're just starting in the wrong place. You cannot just sprinkle in human rights into a global counterterrorism strategy review and address those fundamental deficits at the national level. It requires a deeper kind of strategic and long-term investment. Let me turn to an issue close to my heart, which is the issue of women's rights and the important consideration of ensuring gender is central to the work of the global counterterrorism strategy in member states and acknowledging the work of the Global Center in yet again elevating this question through the Blue Skies report. For my part, as I reported to the Human Rights Council in a, in a report just um, two years ago, we have enormous deficits in relation to the situation of women and girls in counterterrorism globally. At the heart of the challenges that we have is that equality is the issue. And um, ASG Gregorian addressed the question of uh, Afghanistan. And I would simply say the issue there is that half the population do not have equal rights. 
And so we can, again, sprinkle in women and girls to counter terrorism. But if we are not fundamentally addressing issues of inequality, participation, inclusion, and the harm that women and girls across the globe are experiencing from adverse counterterrorism, we are not addressing the situation of equality, gender, and inclusion of women in the CT space. So one of the key points I would say here is that the women, peace, and security agenda has really taught us over the past 20 years that when you engage women and girls in issues of security, it's not just about adding women and girls and steering, but it is about having them at the heart of these processes from the very beginning. So the CT arena shouldn't be starting out 20 years behind the women, peace, and security agenda. The peace and the, the lessons from the WPS agenda about mainstreaming gender and ensuring the equality of women and girls in security spaces are profoundly relevant to the starting point we should all be engaging in in this arena. Let me close by making just two final remarks on civil society and on independent oversight. I look forward uh, in June on the 21st of uh, Wednesday, the 21st of June, the mandate will deliver its global study on the impact of counterterrorism on civic space and civil society. And again, I want to acknowledge the Blue Skies reports and its commitment to elevating once again, the role of civil society. I know that this is a thorny question, but let's be clear. We will not get to effective preventative holistic counterterrorism and the conditions that produce it unless civil society is at the heart of the process. Civil society is part of the solution to the complex matrix of violence being experienced in multiple societies. But again, we have a long way to go before we address the inclusion and the harms being caused to civil society through counterterrorism work across the globe. To give a sneak piece peek at the global study, I would just underscore the ways in which we have documented the global misuse of counterterrorism and PCBE measures against civil society actors. And these harms are not just singular and they're not um, happening um, occasionally. They're systemic, they're structural, they're intersectional and they're compounded. And so the challenge for member states is not just to think about this in the abstract, but to fundamentally address the ways in which counterterrorism practice across the globe is negatively impacting the constituencies we need the most to prevent terrorism. And so the value proposition of, of civil society is clear, but the harms they experience are also clear. So we have to build on the work that we've done in the seventh review by acknowledging for the first time that harm is experienced by civil society and address the logical consequences of what that recognition means. Let me close by saying, as the mandate has done, that we continue to believe that for member states, independent oversight, monitoring and evaluation is in your interest. It is in your interest to hold the UN accountable for the money and the resources you give us to do work in counterterrorism. There are separate mechanisms and places that oversee member states' enforcement of counterterrorism at the national level. But there is an important, fundamental, symbolic, and practical significance to holding the scale of investment in counterterrorism accountable to the high risks and the harms that we're seeing from counterterrorism uh, use. And the, the ensuring that what the UN is doing in this space is consistent with the priorities and values of member states. So let me close by saying I know we have an intensive couple of weeks ahead. This is a really important conversation to have at this time. And the mandate stands ready, as it always does, to assist member states in, in any way with, that we can in the weeks ahead. We look forward to seeing everyone, of course, in July when we are celebrating and it's all over. So thank you. Thank you, Fanula, including for uh, ending us on that, on that happy note, uh, but particularly grateful for uh, the uh, really important overview of those, those key issues. Uh, that you highlighted and of course we all look forward to 
the release of, of the global study, uh, which is, uh, I think, an appropriate bridge to uh, our last uh, panelist at the table, Amandeep uh, Tiwana, Chief Programs Officer at Civicus, uh, who have for a very long time studied uh, civic space uh, and its increasing uh, decline and the many ways in which a range of security efforts uh, affect that. So, uh, Mandeep, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and I'm <clears throat> very pleased to be here. And first of all, let me congratulate you and your colleagues on producing an excellent report. The strength of research that's gone into it, the cogency of the arguments is excellent. I'm going to be speaking from the perspective of a global civil society alliance. We work at Civicus through our members and partners in over 175 countries. Most of our members are human rights and social justice organizations. Many of them are activists. Every member is expected to abide by the principles enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All our members and partners use peaceful means to achieve constitutional ends. I want to begin with a value proposition, or with an assumption, rather. We all here are talking about counterterrorism mechanisms. The ultimate aim of counterterror mechanisms is to create better, more peaceful, just, equal, and sustainable societies, which have been agreed to in Agenda 2030. And later this year, world leaders will be coming to host the SDG Summit, and there will be several conversations around achievement of Agenda 2030, which is arguably the greatest ever human endeavor to create more peaceful, just, equal, and sustainable societies, the very reasons why we engage in protection methods, in, protect, in security measures to protect people and, and our institutions. And while we'll be discussing major bottlenecks to the achievement of Agenda 2030 later this year, a major impediment for our work is the repurposing of security discourse to persecute activists and organizations that speak truth to power, that uncover serious human rights violations, and that uncover corruption in high places. And that remains a huge challenge. Even some of the world's best respected CSOs that are meticulous about following the law, such as Amnesty International, Oxfam, and Greenpeace, have been subjected to uh, abusive rhetoric through security discourse, and many of their staff have been subjected to counter-terror and security legislation for their work. So it remains a huge challenge. In fact, in my work at Civicus every day, not a day goes by when I don't hear of a civil society colleague or activist who, 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 who complains of having been persecuted. Many of our colleagues have had false cases registered under the pretext of security legislation. Many of our organizations whom we work with, our members who have spent organizations with credible histories of seeking to support and advance human rights and social justice norms enshrined in international law, the very, the very rules, the very norms that, that the United Nations seeks to protect, those organizations are at risk of deregistering. They are prevented from getting international funding through credible international sources in the name of countering terrorism. In fact, the challenge remains is because these organizations are exposing grave human rights violations, because they are uncovering corrupt relationships between political and economic elites against agribusinesses that may be taking over, over land that belongs to indigenous communities. They may be uncovering, extra, uh, uncovering pollution by extractive industries that, that, are, that are destroying uh, the, uh, the, the environment for, low, for communities that rely on natural resources for their sustenance. And, they and this remains a huge challenge for, for, for our work as, as, uh, as civicus and uh, for, for, the, uh, for civil society as large, at large as uh, the Special Rapporteur uh, so emphatically noted. I also want to note the Assistant Secretary General's words about how civil society provides evidence-based uh, 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 answers to many of, many of the world's most intractable solutions. Now, all the challenges that civil society is facing all the world across the world has negative consequences because we know that civil society organizations support inclusive policy making. They help keep the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized communities in the center of decision making, people who don't count in the political calculations of the government of the day. They oftentimes ensure service delivery to people 
oftentimes at much lower cost than that is provided by the, by the private sector. They support governments in the delivery of their basic responsibilities, and importantly, they act as watchdogs to ensure that public resources are spent for the purpose that they were intended, and that is why they, they are being invited to, to such amount of persecution. And Melissa, you mentioned about global civic space conditions. So at Civicus, through the Civicus Monitor, which is a participatory platform and which through which we and a research collaboration of over 20 civil society organizations around the world, which looks at the core civil society freedoms of expression, peaceful assembly and association, which are enshrined in the constitutions of almost every country, which are part of the International Bill of Rights, we find that in 117 countries and territories uh, around the world, there are very serious restrictions in law, policy, and practice on these core civil society freedoms, which in itself is an infringement of international law. So we are using international law and policy to counter, uh, uh, to counter terrorism, and, we are, and in doing so, we are also infringing the very law and policy that we want to use to protect human lives, to safeguard human well-being, and that remains a huge challenge for us. I'm always struck uh, whenever I enter the United Nations and I see Nelson Mandela's uh, statue out there, which welcomes us all. In our work at Civicus, we find that there are hundreds of Nelson Mandelas around the world who are languishing on, uh, in prison because they were part of mobilizations around the world. The right to peaceful protest through which we civil society was able to achieve decolonization, through which the civil rights movement was propelled and equal rights were achieved, through which gender justice uh, struggles have been, have been supported, and, by which young, and through which young people have actually uh, um, helped decision makers, including the United Nations, to be alive to the climate emergency is being suppressed in very, very serious ways. The right to peaceful protest through which our societies get transformed is oftentimes being confabulated as a security risk. And we are seeing uh, lots of legislation, including in democracies, in the name of public order security discourse that is being, that is being introduced to, uh, uh, to uh, suppress this very basic right. Uh, I do also want to emphasize that the UN Secretary General's call to action, which was introduced in February 2020, the call to action calls for the protection of civic space in the achievement of Agenda 2030, which is agreed to by all countries of the world, which all states uh, are, are expected to uphold. It's a universal agenda. There's no argument on that. Yet, we find that civic space conditions remain hugely challenging. So my request uh, here to, uh, to, to to our member states would be, let's see if we can, inc we can work towards increasing uh, better standards in law policy and practice on civic freedoms. And also, uh, there's an excellent template that has been prepared by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, that is the UN-wide guidance on civic space, which talks about protection, promotion, and participation of civil society actors uh, in ensuring uh, uh, achievement of international law and uh, developmental norms. Thank you. Mandeep, thank you for your, your call to action and for the really important work that Civicus does uh, around, around the world, uh, monitoring uh, and, and improving um, uh, the civic space that is so, so direly needed, um, and indeed recognizing the many ways in which counterterrorism legislation, through their misuse and abuse, uh, have affected that very civic space and the very partners that we need um, uh, to actually have more effective uh, counterterrorism PV approaches. Um, we have five minutes left on the clock. I have uh, six confirmed interventions and one set of closing remarks. So I'm going to ask you to bear with us for an extra 10 minutes, if you can borrow that time um, uh, to us, uh, to also hear from a variety of, of additional speakers. I will ask the interventions to be kept short, two to three minutes max, uh, so that we can land this plane uh, somewhere around uh, 240, 245, uh, if you would uh, indulge us. Um, thank you to all of the panelists uh, for, for their reflections, uh, and I will turn first uh, to my left uh, to Ambassador Tarek Ladep, the permanent representative of Tunisia and one of the co-facilitators of the current GCTS process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elko. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you to participate in this very fruitful discussion at this uh, very uh, crucial uh, um, stage of the process of uh, the eighth review as uh, we have concluded today the third and last uh, session of uh, discussions uh, in our uh, roadmap. 
Uh, I wish also to thank the Global Center for uh, your engagement uh, and congratulate you on uh, la launching uh, the Blue Sky uh, report. Uh, the report is, uh, and, the, and the recommendations are very useful and tackle substantive questions that the review of the strategy is seeking to cover most of them. As we are about to conclude the eighth review, uh, hopefully by the adoption of the new text on the 22nd of June, I would like to make uh, some reflections on the whole process in general. Uh, after eight iteration of the review, it is always legitimate to aspire to a more efficient, inclusive, and meaningful outcome. So the central question as all should endeavor to answer is the following. What is the purpose and the added value of the GCTS review? In my point of view, the answer to this question is multi-layered and multi-dimensional. The first layer concerns member states. Any intergovernmental undertaking such as the GCTS is an exp expression by each member state of its political will. Despite the controversies on many issues, as we have seen during the discussions, it is an indicator of a willingness to continue to engage and to find solutions. From this point of view, the review serves to convey a strong political message of an international consensus. It demonstrates the commitment of all our countries to prevent counterterrorism and to combat it in all its manifestations. While it is not an easy task, it is necessary one, and each one of us bears the responsibility to preserve and contribute to this consensus the best of our ability. The second dimension concerns practitioners. The UN strategy aims to set standards on which national authorities base themselves to develop national and regional counterterrorism strategies. Therefore, we must bear in mind that we need an outcome which can realistically be implemented on the ground, one that practitioners would be able to read, clearly identify priorities and solutions, and subsequently adapt to their respective national contexts and priorities. The third strategy review present third, the strategy review presents a platform for dialogue of dialogue among stakeholders. The review is a vehicle of an open dialogue that formally and informally gather everyone around the table. The Blue Sky Report and this discussion are a prime example that civil society, think tanks, researchers, private sector, academia, and other stakeholders have invaluable contribution, which must be heard and taken into account. Last but not least, the strategy review is not only about adapting the text to the new trends of terrorism and challenges, which is of paramount importance, but also is an opportunity to assess implementation and sort out where we have collectively succeeded in the past and what we can do to be more efficient. As we keep on developing more and more language, we must think seriously about measuring real impact on the ground through holistic approaches, balanced implementation across all four pillars of the strategy. As you are all aware, these are not easy tasks. However, a few months into my experience as a co-facilitator, I can confidently say that the strong basis uh, for consensus exists on key issues, including that we must all stand behind a sustained, consensual, and fit for purpose strategy that takes into consideration human rights, civil society, gender dimension, and the rule uh, of law that international cooperation at all levels is essential to effectively address the threat of terrorism, and that a whole of government, whole of society, and whole of UN transparent approach that includes all relevant stakeholders within their relevant roles and capacities is necessary for a comprehensive strategy with effective measures. We will, as co-facilitators, continue to listen carefully to the views of all stakeholders for an inclusive strategy that ba and balanced implementation. I once again 
ag again commend the Global Center for its substantive analysis and recommendations. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Ladep, and um, thank you for the hard work that you and uh, Ambassador Ray are doing in this uh, this critical critical process. Um, I'm going to move uh, to uh, one of our virtual uh, interventions um, by Eric van der Veen, the officer in charge of the Terrorism Prevention Branch uh, of UNODC, and we'll then afterwards turn to my right uh, to uh, um, Ambassador Mark Zanenrad, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the King of the Netherlands, as he will need to leave uh, shortly. So a slight, slight change to the program, but we're getting there. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Uh, Ilko, thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, good evening, Excellencies, colleagues. Um, I'm honored to be here with you today on behalf of the Terrorism Prevention Branch of the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, we are proud to have been part of the Blue Sky process. Um, UNODC, for, for one, has been a participant in the consultations that underpin uh, the report that is being launched today. Um, and we commend the Global Center for institutionalizing an independent and inclusive analysis of the UN's counterterrorism efforts over, over many years. Um, similar in some ways and, and different in others um, was our process that fed into the development of a UNODC's new strategic framework on preventing terrorism. Um, and this was uh, launched late last, last year and into the development of this program we spoke to more than 70 member states, UN entities, regional organizations, civil society stakeholders, um, academic institutions, as well as uh, private sector entities. Um, and this, this also included the Global Center, um, so then it will come to no surprise uh, if I tell you that in such consultations, you may not always hear what you expect to hear or even what you want to hear. Um, but we recognize that listening to those messages and uh, integrating diverse perspectives um, into our work will ultimately lead to better outcomes. Um, so in our exercise, our interlocutors uh, largely agreed on two main recommendations to, to us at UNODC. Um, one was to continue and scale up um, our rule of law based approaches for legal, preventive and criminal justice responses to terrorism. And the other was to um, expand our partnership base and work with a wider array of stakeholders. Um, and not for the sake of it, uh, but because this will achieve, um, this will help achieve more accountable and sustainable results. So um, as a result, we at, at UNODC now operate within a framework that supports terrorism prevention through inclusive strategies, policies, and other measures that focus on the safety and protection of people aimed at leaving no one behind. Um, and in many ways, this integrates a lot of the recommendations that the, uh, Blue Sky, the Blue Sky report also proposes. A meaningful engagement of civil society, an increased emphasis on, on human rights and gender equality, as well as more capacity to monitor and evaluate our work to ensure that it is, that it is effective and results oriented. Um, we look forward to continuing our collaboration with, with all partners and to together make the world a safer place for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric, for your uh, reflections from UNODC's perspective. Um, I'm going to turn next uh, to uh, DPR uh, Zanenrath from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. floor is yours. Thank you, Ilko. And Great thank you to the whole team at the Global Center, also to you, Tracy and Melissa, for that excellent presentation. And uh, I, I'm always in awe when I, when I read the reports, and, and I think you said that in your introduction, Ilko, the global level, the institutional level, the programmatic level, it's huge, and the field itself is huge. But uh, every time you manage to bring it somehow coherently into a report with very clear recommendations, and um, it's the sixth, right? It's on everyone's screen. Um, and I think if we would try and find a common thread in all of these six reports, it would probably be very close to what the Special Rapporteur also mentioned and, and what you mentioned also, Melissa, on Pillar 4. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done on that pillar. So let's look ahead at the seventh report, you know, if, if that is, uh, and we're, we're undoubtedly going to get there. We'll be here again in two years' time. But uh, there's two recommendations that I would just then like to highlight where if we're looking ahead at uh, the seventh report, 
uh, hopefully we can find that, uh, that progress. And the first is, is actually recommendation 10, and it's on the integration of the rule, and law, uh, rule of law, human rights, and gender, and then having some sort of an independent oversight mechanism in place. And I think that is a really important recommendation because this is a way in which we can have a mechanism in place and whatever shape that would take would really be focused on these three elements that I think are a common thread in all of your reports over the last 12 years, namely rule of law, human rights, and gender. And again, I'm echoing also what Mandeep, uh, I think, just said. And the other recommendation is number 13, and hopefully this is not an unlucky number, a number in this regard, and that's the one on OCT, UN OCT, we just heard it on the um, updating of the civil society engagement strategy. And I think that is, uh, I wouldn't say low-hanging fruit, but I think that is definitely something uh, that in two years' time we would uh, love to see uh, reflected in a report. I know the Global Center is already doing a scoping exercise in that regard. I think it's going to come out very soon, uh, in uh, this month, if I'm... Uh, yeah, September, or September, for, high, for the other high-level week. Um, so hopefully uh, there's a lot of room to discuss that further also in the upcoming time. Uh, I do apologize, I have to leave, and I wish all the colleagues uh, good luck, especially the distinguished PR of Tunisia in this crunch time, both for the review and a CT High Level Week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, DPR Zalanrat. Uh, appreciate those, those reflections. Um, I will now turn uh, to Letta, Letta Taylor, um, Associate Director at Human Rights Watch, uh, for her intervention. Thank you so much, Elko, and, th and thank you, everyone. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I agree with so much of what my colleagues have said, including on the value of the Global Center's work and I, this really extraordinary report, in my view. Um, and um, But I, I want to emphasize, as, uh, uh, as many others have, that we must urge, I would urge against complacency, uh, even though there, have been, ha there has been progress uh, on incorporating human rights concerns into counterterrorism initiatives at the UN level. Much needs to be done, and there are many interests quite hard at work on unraveling uh, hard-fought gains uh, in, in ensuring that those rights are protective, and we've seen uh, just how uh, how contentious uh, the protection of some of these rights is in terms of efforts to remove remove or alter certain paragraphs within the uh, global uh, strategy review language, uh, within the global re review strategy draft itself. So, so that is the first point I want to make. Um, I will just jump straight to, to recommendations. Um, I largely support and laud several of the, of the uh, Global Center's recommendations on bolstering human rights, uh, including several that have already been mentioned. But I'd also just like to step back a minute uh, as uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleague at Civicus and the UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism have, have already done uh, and, and reflect on some of the big issues that really make human rights protection so difficult at the UN, and, and really, for me, so much of it boils down to the lack of a universally agreed upon definition of terrorism. We have, since 9-11, seen this mushrooming of UN counterterrorism apparatus and binding uh, Security Council resolutions on counterterrorism that require member states to crack down on terrorism and violent extremism without defining what either is. Uh, so I would urge uh, all member states and UN entities to reflect on, well, if, if we can't resolve in the near future what terrorism is, surely uh, the UN and member states can at the very least define what it is not and make this a central part of UN strategies and mandates. So as we know, terrorism is not extremist views that, however abhorrent to many of us, are not intended to kill, seriously harm, or take hostage a population or a segment of it for particular reasons. Terrorism is not being from a particular race, ethnic group, religion, etc. Terrorism is not participation in an armed conflict in and of itself. Terrorism is, of course, not peaceful dissent, including free speech and protest. If the UN's counterterrorism apparatus cannot address these definitional gaps, 
and follow up meaningfully with member states on overly broad definitions, then I would argue that most of its other efforts to counter terrorism, including its efforts on the global counterterrorism strategy, risk being largely futile. At risk is global security, the universal rights system that the UN has worked so hard to create, and the UN's reputation. I'm sorry to end on such a bleak note, but <laughs> I hope you'll take this into consideration. And thanks again on a terrific report. Thank you so much, uh, Letta, for uh, those important important reminders and indeed taking a step back, uh, understanding that counterterrorism happens uh, not just in a vacuum, but against a far broader context uh, of uh, these human rights and civic space um, issues. Um, we have two more short virtual interventions, and then I will turn to uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Switzerland uh, to, uh, to close us close us out. Um, so next I will turn um, uh, online to Jordan Street, Senior Policy and Adv Advocacy Lead at Safer World. Uh, Jordan, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much, Alco. Um, sorry I couldn't be there today. Um, really great job to the Global Centre team for another fantastic Blue Sky report. Um, so thorough, as the, the ambassador from Netherlands said, um, you do a great job at bringing everything together. So thanks so much for, for this. Um, I think just one point really about the overall strategic role of counterterrorism in the wider UN ecosystem. Um, this is the moment really to be prudent and ask ourselves what architecture we really want as this, this architecture continues to grow. Um, the GCTS is obviously one form to answer these questions, but the Fifth Committee is another. And, and as mentioned by others in the room, the, the latest proposed by the SG uh, for his proposed program budget for 2024 requests a further conversion of 24 more posts for the OCT. Um, if approved, this means that there's 57 conversions over the past two years. Um, for comparison, in a year when we're talking about the new agenda for peace, the UN Peace Building Support Office has 17 regular budget positions. So resource proposals from the Secretary General here don't actually seem to be following the rhetoric. Um, and I do appreciate the case made by the Deputy to the Under Secretary General of, of the Office of Counterterrorism, but I do believe that the budget proposal should also be assessed in com comparison to other functions in the UN system. Uh, and 57 to 17 is starting to appear slightly lopsided to me. Um, so really want to highlight the, the really spot on recommendation by the Global Centre team, uh, recommendation two, which calls for states to consider why additional UN OCT posts are deemed critical versus other important investments in different parts of the UN system. Uh, these are the discussions I think states should be having and not necessarily viewing the Secretary General's recommendation for his program budget as a fait accompli. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan, um, including for keeping keeping it uh, so so brief. Appreciate it. Um, and then, last but certainly not least, we're going to turn to Martin Martin Yui from the Institute for Security Security Studies, uh, joining us uh, quite late uh, in the day. So really grateful, Martin, that you've uh, you've kept with us uh, as we're uh, trying to move this uh, session to a close. Martin, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Echo. Uh, I am actually joining on behalf of. Uh, Dr. Fonte Akum, the executive director of the Institute, who was supposed to, to be here, but due to conflict in scheduling, uh, he had to withdraw at the last minute. Uh, but um, we, we would like really to thank uh, the Global Center for invoking a critical issue uh, of our time in the global response to terrorism. Uh, we fully uh, endorse and agree with the key findings and recommendations of the report. I believe that the report reflect uh, the voice of the civil society. Um, Counterterrorism uh, in Africa is waning. Uh, state commitment to the campaign uh, has uh, significantly declined, and it seems as if uh, we have already won the war. Uh, some are saying it is blue sky, uh, you know, uh, universally that we have won the war against uh, terrorism, which is not which is far from that, because in Africa, we actually seen and witnessing uh, the continuous uh, uh, infiltration and increase of the Islamic State uh, taking up uh, more, more countries. And therefore, this is a concerning, it's a concern that uh, we believe should be taken seriously by state. Uh, we have also seen uh, the role of the UN uh, decline. Uh, this is not what went uh, the, in the immediate post 
9-11, the role that the UN play in terms of really mobilizing the international community. Yeah, uh, on, uh, we, we are gathering because uh, the eighth review conference of the global counterterrorism strategy uh, is here. Uh, and thank uh, the Global uh, Center for the, the report, the Blue Sky Report, which uh, I believe has really brought to the fore some of the key issues that civil society have, especially for us in Africa. Those of us in the civil society uh, field in Africa, we face a tremendous challenge in terms of finding space, in terms of finding access uh, to work with state. And this should not be so because we, we are in a continent where uh, state face Herculean challenge, uh, especially uh, in the post-COVID world. Uh, where states are not able to deliver in many cases, and they need civil society to complement uh, their activities. But yet, uh, we are struggling to really uh, find for ourselves the space that we need to complement state action. So we hope that this can be taken on board and we can work to, uh, towards amel ameliorating that situation. Uh, we, uh, one thing I want to raise before we uh, wrap up uh, my uh, intervention, uh, Echo, is, is the fact that in Africa, we've seen a lot the implementation of um, Pillar 2, uh, particularly with the increasing use of peacekeeping to respond to terrorism in Africa. But yet, we have not clearly articulated what role that peacekeeping uh, really has to play uh, in terms of combating terrorism. We've seen very little uh, progress, uh, very little positive outcome with the use of uh, peacekeeping. Instead, um, the, the increasing use of peacekeeping has led to the difficult challenge of implementing other uh, pillars of the global strategy. Uh, we've been talking about uh, serious gaps in the implementation of Pillar 4. This is particularly the case in Africa, especially in context where peacekeeping uh, have been deployed. So we want to, uh, to make sure that, uh, yes, we, we, need, uh, we need this collective security mechanism to respond to terrorism, but that should not be at the detriment of pillar one, uh, pillar three, and pillar four. So we should be able to bring all of this together and uh, fight terrorism in a very comprehensive way. So not, not, none of these pillars should uh, take uh, precedence over the, the order. So uh, I would like to conclude here, but uh, once again to insist that um, the role of civil society in Africa uh, remains ad hoc. Uh, it is not consistent because states, in many cases, we face difficulties in negotiating access uh, uh, with state actors. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, for providing those insights uh, from the really important work that ISS is undertaking across the African continent uh, and bringing in, uh, in particular, uh, also some of the, the peace building questions um, that um, are, of course, in the minds of many in the, in the room here today. Um, last but not least, and with great appreciation for all of your um, uh, time, particularly yours, um, really appreciate uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of Switzerland, uh, Ricardo Chanda, uh, for uh, the final remarks. Thank you. Elko, Excellencies, colleagues, uh, Switzerland thanks the organizers and uh, the speakers of this meeting for their very thorough and thought-provoking presentations. This event clearly underlines why we need to continuously engage with civil society actors in our efforts of preventing and countering terrorism. We need perspectives from the field, we need perspectives um, from outside of the UN system, and we, he we need to hear the voices from those that are most affected and those from those we seek to, to have their support. Or no, sorry, from those we seek to support. Otherwise, lasting success seems hard to achieve. Let me congratulate you on the launch of the RD6 edition of the Blue Sky Report. As a longtime partner of the Global Center and supporter of the Blue Sky process, we highly appreciate this important contribution. The report before us not only offers a comprehensive assessment of current and past UN counterterrorism action, but also shares great insights on how we may successfully tackle the issues still ahead of us. I would like to highlight three recommendations from the report. First of all, measuring the global counterterrorism strategy's implementation, clear, transparent, evidence-based and results-oriented approaches must be the foundation of all UN efforts. Switzerland believes that a unified results framework 
elaborated in a collaborative and transparent manner and with all relevant stakeholders is key to understanding the effect, efficiency and progress of the implementation of the global strategy. It will help us identify and measure our success and make improvements where needed. Such a framework will also ensure that risks are properly taken into account and it will allow for accountability for unintended negative consequences. Lastly, this framework will also advance a balanced implementation of the strategy at all levels, the importance of which has been highlighted countless times by many member states during the review process. Secondly, deliver, delivering on the rule of law, human rights and gender commitments, we must ensure the full respect for international law, the rule of law, human rights and gender equality in all efforts geared at preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism. This requires that both member states and the UN make progress on accountability and access to justice and establish corresponding enforcement mechanisms. Within the framework of the global strategy, we continue to support the idea of an independent oversight mechanism to assess the rule of law, human rights and gender impact of the UN's counter-terrorism action. Such a mechanism would go a long way ensuring that we deliver on the commitments we made. Thirdly, meaningfully engagement with a diverse civil society. The blue sky process shows once more why civil society engagement is vital in preventing and countering terrorism, not only within the UN system, but at all levels, global, regional, and local. They are at the heart of the solution, as the special rapporteur just, just said. Yet far too often, CSOs do not have an equal seat at the table or may even face reprisals, reprisals for their work we need to provide the necessary framework for a meaningful and safe participation of civil society actors in decision-making processes on matters that directly affect all of us. In particular, women, youth, and victim associations deserve more recognition in their role as actors of change. In this regard, we will continue to use our voice both during the Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review as well as during our term on the UN Security Council to contribute to the realization of the five corresponding recommendations of Blue Sky 6 in this area. And with this, a huge thank you again to everyone for this very important discussion today and to the Global Center for your important work. We're very much looking forward to Blue Sky at 7, as Mark just said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Chanda, and to you and, and all uh, of, of the donors that have supported this process. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with us uh, as we've gone through uh, these really interesting discussions uh, to our panelists, uh, the various uh, speakers, and those that have been consulted throughout the Blue Sky process as well. It's not just a report that magically uh, um, uh, uh, is created. It's one that uh, really depends on all of your various insights and inputs. So thank you to that. And then finally and lastly, uh, a big thank you to my co-authors, Tracy, uh, Melissa, uh, and Franzi, as well as the other Global Center team members that have both made the report, uh, as well as the process in this meeting happened today. Thank you, everybody. Good luck with the remaining uh, negotiations, uh, and we look forward to seeing a lot more of all of you in the coming month. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.